Hey brothers, sisters in Christ, friends, uh, family, uh, people on YouTube. When it comes to worship on Sunday morning and Sunday evening, are we allowed to use contemporary music? Is that okay? Is that acceptable to God? What about music that seems to manipulate people's emotions, provoking them to maybe what some might call an emotional high? Or should we stick to more old school, traditional, time-tested hymns and psalms and spiritual hymns. Well, that's the controversy that we're going to be dealing with. My name is Tim. This is our final episode in our 13 or 12 series, um, YouTube series, um, going through chapter by chapter of this book called With Reverence and Awe, Returning to the Basics of Reformed Worship. Today, our chapter is called Song in Worship. And what we've been trying to do is um, recap or summarize every single chapter and just pull quotations from the book and, you know, as if you're reading the book. Um, to be honest, this has taken me like a year to do. Um, I've been a little bit busy, so finally I've gotten a good time to uh, get on it and record this last video, and, and hopefully we'll finish strong. So the chapter opens with a question. It says, for whom does the church sing in worship? And it answers with Psalm 98 verse, verse 1, quote, O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. As we turn our attention to music, we come to the last and extremely divisive topic when it comes to our contemporary setting. It's what we call the worship wars. And the worship wars go back in history. It's an in-house debate about singing, and the sides were divided between those who were more traditional. They defended hymns the hymns of the 18th, 17th, 19th century, versus those who were advocating more contemporary music, who instead insisted on the use of praise songs from the 1970s and 80s. Now, when you visit your local church, when you visit many, many churches, you'll see who's winning these debates, who's winning, what side is prominent. This is significant because... The church has long understood the importance of song and worship. Martin Luther, the reformer, said, for instance, that music was a gift from God that had the natural power of stimulating and arousing the souls of men. Calvin, likewise, stressed the power of music when he said, quote, We know from experience that song has great force and vigor to arouse and inflame the hearts of men to invoke and praise God with a more vehement and ardent zeal. And I likewise can testify from my own experiences that when I grow cold or I have a lukewarm season or I'm dull, like, like we know that we can go to the hymns and we can sing and praise God and, and God seems to revive us and we have a fresh zeal. And, and so when we, when we sing hymns in the mornings, for instance, day by day, that zeal and that love for God, I don't know what it is, but it seems to stay. You know, when we look at this debate, when we look at the different sides, we would say that neither side is necessarily violating the regulative principle. For this reason, we need to exercise Christian prudence and discernment in determining what is proper song and worship. Let's turn our attention to singing psalms, for instance. Not only is singing the psalms a historically reformed practice, but it is nourishing to the soul. Many of the contemporary choruses, in contrast, are filled with emotion. The psalms, interestingly, are full of just as much emotion, but the difference between psalms and contemporary music, what distinguishes them, is that the psalms are inspired by God the Holy Spirit, whereas contemporary songs are not. Therefore, psalms not only provide an emotional outlet for which Calvinists, who are not well known for necessary emotion, are still able to instill their hearts with godly emotion and express their hearts in godly ways. 
Next, let's move on to the brief discussion of how the regulative principle of worship should inform our congregational singing. We began the book and indeed the series with describing the antithesis between the church and the world. These things are in direct opposition, the church being the seed of the woman and the people of God living in this world, but not of this world versus the world, which is the seed of the serpent, the, the people who are not born again, who are in the domain of darkness, not transferred into the kingdom of, of, of God's beloved son. So when the church is engaged in public worship, it is in direct opposition to the world. When we sing, we sing to a God that the world refuses to acknowledge. As we mentioned in the past, the purpose of the church is not merely to win souls, but to disciple and to edify the people of God. And therefore, congregational songs should edify the people of God. We shouldn't use music as a vehicle to attract tourists or outsiders or appeal to the unchurched world. Now, pausing there and moving yet to another principle. We think of the way we sing in public worship, which is the way that we approach the Lord. And that is with reverence and with awe. Godly fear should characterize our song, both in word and in melody. It is good and wise to ask whether a given hymn for worship will cultivate the sensibilities of reverence along with self-control, discipline, and moderation. John Calvin believed that song was chiefly a form of prayer. It was not, as many argue today, a way of teaching the word in order to communicate theology, though I personally believe it is both, because I believe it's in Colossians 3 where it talks about sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts, and there's this language in that text or in that chapter, or maybe it's in another chapter, which, which implies this idea of singing for the edification of your brothers and sisters in Christ, ministering to them through song. And since God is the audience of our singing, there should not be any performance component to it. Indeed, as we read in the outset, Psalm 98 verse 1 says, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. One consideration that arises is this, is the choir singing to God on behalf of the congregation or ministering to the congregation as ambassadors of God? It's one or the other. Now, if ministers are the ones given the task of leading prayer in the public worship setting, is it proper for one part of the congregation who has not been ordained to lead in prayer for the rest of the church? Now, they imply that it's not, and only those people who are ordained should lead in public worship. Finally, the final consideration regarding songs in worship based on the foundation that we've built throughout the book is the place of the regulative principle in worship. God regulates how he is to be worshipped from his word. Worship that is acceptable to God is that which pleases God according to his revelation in scripture. We may find ourselves yearning for the music of this world, but such yearning does not justify the use of such songs. And indeed, these authors talk about the example of the Israelites. When they were delivered out of Egypt, um, they yearned to go back to Egypt once they were in the wilderness. But that yearning is synonymous to our yearning being delivered out of the world, being now in God's kingdom, being now in God's sheepfold, being now the people of God, and still having yearnings um, to go to, for things of this world. Those are fleshy yearnings, not of God, not of the Spirit. So we've demonstrated that worship, contrary to much public opinion, is not a matter of taste, but of theological conviction. When we sing as a congregation, we give musical expression to the faith we profess, which is beautiful. When looking at older hymns and comparing them to new or praise songs, we notice the predominance of the first person personal pronoun in the latter. They're full of eyes, me's, my's, from the perspective of the singer, that is. Whereas I think it's fair to say that when we look at the older hymns and psalms, there's a strong balance between the individual and the corporate expression of piety. 
In the same vein, the newer songs have shifted from God-centeredness to man-centeredness. And Michael Horton addresses this when he says that the biblical text, the Bible never gives us the subjective apart from the objective. It never concentrates on what we are to do before establishing what God has already done. Think of the book of Romans, with the first 11 chapters being doctrine and theology and gospel, and the last, latter, starting at 12 to 16, it is the application, the subjective. First the objective and then the subjective. And um, then Terry L. Johnson, writing in the Westminster Journal, offers four tests for weighing songs and hymns we sing during worship. The first one is, is it singable? Can it be sung by untrained voices? The second one is, is it biblically and theologically sound? Songs containing errors about God and his attributes have no place in worship that seeks to please him. Thirdly, is it biblically and theologically mature? To this, John Calvin said, There must always be concern that the song be neither light nor frivolous, but have gravity and majesty. And finally, is it emotionally balanced? There is a difference between emotion and emotionalism. There is a difference between emotion being the product of the gospel and its effect and and like like it having a place in our lives and what God has done to us and God's grace and considering how we were full of sin but God saved us. That should lead us to emotion. That there should be an expression of emotion. That's one thing. But then emotionalism is this emotional manipulation, not necessarily through words, but through the music and the melody and the build-up and the drums and the guitar. And so emotionalism, I believe, have no place in worship. So a strong emotional appeal in our music without accompanying theological content is manipulative. And those are the four tests, and that is the conclusion of the chapter. I, I didn't cover everything, but I think these are the biggest points, and hopefully you got maybe a deeper understanding of, of how we should look at contemporary music and praise songs versus the older, more mature um, hymns and psalms. So that's, that leads us to the end, and I will summarize the 12 or 11 chapters that we went through because this is the end of our series. If you... Um, this is your first time, welcome. If this is your 10th, 10th, 11th, 12th time, I hope that uh, this has been educational. So chapter one, we talked about the church and the world. Then we talked about the purpose of the church. Number three was a worshiping community. Number four was the holy day of worship. Number five was accept acceptable worship. Number six was reformed liturgy. Number seven was leading and participating in worship. Number eight was worship with godly fear. Number nine was the means of grace. Number 10 was elements, circumstances, and forms. And finally, number 11 was song and worship. Thank you guys for watching. If you made it this far and God bless you. Bye-bye.